El tron is a guinecore, her in Gaydal chess, a Carmilla Magata, Sakton Corello, her lock shed, Iskmala Shena, Sakton Firkin Fulcha, Darish of Gilier, Ram Hain, as Redma Van Kale, Scythian, a to her sarum ve, Resh, and Ils Elskilsha, Agasaka Hoide, Agas Mutte Cortus, Leshre, Leoctona, Tori Hovoktak. To play over a talk, 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 near wonder, snadinita and filoher, a dust not in your taller chiacht. So Garmaki Gilier is a erna ushly a sulit ton ohas, to her sarum ve in your mask. President, it is an honor and a responsibility that I receive gladly to have been asked to address you as part of the Ethics for All Public Lecture series that you have organized in Dublin City University in cooperation with the Matter Day Institute of Education. And I have thanked you, President of DCU, President Brian McGrath, and I compliment you for the emphasis that you are placing on the importance of social responsibility and the place of ethics in all of our lives, not only for now, but for the generations to come. And I thank you for kindly inviting me to Cortus to introduce this series of lecture. And I do so, I'm so grateful for the very warm welcome uh, that I have received. I have, in the early days of my inauguration as President of Ireland, said that my presidency would seek to develop an ethical discourse that places human flourishing at the heart of public action. This is a theme and a line of reflection that I hope to develop more systematically over the course of the coming months. So therefore, I particularly welcome this evening's opportunity to outline, however briefly, why I have deemed it essential that we collectively pursue a reflection on ethics and how we, as a people, would benefit from setting about the task of formulating initially an appropriate discourse for a change in public consciousness. I am moved by what you say, President, because indeed, as President of Ireland, I hear, to some extent, the views of the people, the determination of the people, the resilience of the people, but also the kind of distress of the people that maybe after all that we have gone through, things might remain the same. I believe it is not an ethical position that they remain the same, with all of the assumptions unexamined and the rhetoric simply refurbished to handle a new circumstance. The case for the importance of ethics can be put in quite a, a straightforward fashion. We need, as a matter of urgency, to have that discussion so that we can, as David Harvey puts it, act as the conscious architects of the institutional and imaginative worlds we inhabit. With this in mind, I would like tonight, in this lecture that I have entitled Towards an Ethical Economy, focus in particular on the relations between ethical reasoning and economic thought. And I will endeavor to do so by raising some fundamental philosophical questions that are aimed at setting out the general case for an ethical consciousness. Now, while this may be preliminary to the more specific interests of professional ethicists, some of whom are present in the audience, who concern themselves with the application of ethical codes of conduct to, for example, biological and medical practice, legal practice, business or the various academic disciplines dealing with human subjects. It is, I believe, as a basis, important and crucial to begin with a general consideration on the central importance of ethics itself in our lives and in our thought. I believe that codes, protocols, procedures, while important, might mean little unless they are located in a value system that can be shared and understood by all. 
is rather as like in response to the crisis that we've had, that you could do little bits and pieces of refurbishment. You know, I have looked at some of these. At the top end, they are very, very impressive. At the bottom end, they are recipes for not being caught. I think that, therefore, I make this case uh, for a more general consideration. You will notice already, members of my friends in the media are here, that I have been consistent in introducing some obiter dicta to my script. The current state of the European economy, with its high levels of unemployment, poverty, and increasing inequality, is a source of concern, anxiety, and for some even moral outrage for many of our fellow citizens. And there is too, I know, an ongoing debate at national, European and global level as to the acceptability and efficiency, indeed as to the legitimation, as to the legitimate mandates of what have been the orthodox policy responses that were implemented to contain the multifarious consequences of the financial meltdown of 2008. This evening I situate my argument upstream of this debate by suggesting that the problem might not lie so much in a lack of the right answers to the most recent crisis of capitalism, in its most recent form, cognitive capitalism, a distinction I make between the present form and, for example, industrial capitalism or mercantile capitalism of the past. But I suggest that it may be not so much the issue of the absence of right answers as the absence of the right questions. What constitutes a good life? What is necessary to human flourishing? What kinds of human capabilities do particular societies value, encourage, genuinely enable, or seek to block? What conceptions of human nature and the good society underpin our contemporary economic discourse? Can we, as ordinary citizens, enter the discourse on economic policy issues? Or are we perceived as being too economically illiterate for that? Are the issues so complex as to require their being lifted out of the democratic system, including the democratic parliamentary system altogether? These are but a few examples of the questions our times require us to raise, consider, and discuss. And posing the problem in such terms encourages us, I hope, to take a step beyond critical analysis in order to think positively about a set of principles by which we might live and explore the contemporary possibilities for developing ethical arts of economic governance. Before I set to this task, allow me to formulate just one more rhetorical question. Why is it that there is an absence of the right question? The answer I suggest has to do with obstacles placed in the way of such questions by institutional or ideological falsehoods. It also has to do with the exceptional status of economics as a discipline within the field of the social sciences. This observation of mine is neither uncommon nor new, but the recent crisis has failed so far to prompt any far-reaching self-examination between departments of economics in universities across the world as to how economics is taught and should be taught and what the consequences are of teaching it in terms of policy prescriptions. It's interesting that one of the authors I will quote later, Philip Mirowski, speaking at a after a meeting in Bretton Woods in 2011, which was a conference on the new economics thinking, spoke about how all the old figures were back, as if nothing had happened, as if it had been a technical blip before matters go on as before. In his last and important book, entitled L'Empire de la Valère, economist André Orléans remarks that the social sciences all deal with values, whether religious, moral, aesthetic, and that economics makes the same basic assumption as the other social sciences do, namely that members of society are able to coordinate their behavior because they share certain values. 
But economic theory is unique, he claims, in that it has traditionally defined value as a substance. Labor value in the case of classical theory, utility value in the case of neoclassical theory. Those one has the those who has their fellow social scientists regard value as a set of social representations, the expression of collective beliefs, for example. Economists use value as if it were an objective fact which facilitates a claim to scientific status for economics. Orléans goes on to relate a meeting of the French Association of Political Economy in 1908 at which Emil Durkheim delivered a paper pointing out the limits of this contrast. At first sight, Durkheim argued, political economy appears to deal with facts of a very different nature from the other social sciences. Morality and law are essentially matters of opinion. Wealth, which is the subject of political economy, seems on the contrary to be essentially objective and independent of opinion. But he hastened to suggest that the distinction was actually misleading. I quote Durkheim, however the present speaker believes that economic facts can be approached from another viewpoint, they are also to a degree that I will not attempt to define a matter of opinion. The level of wages depends on a fundamental standard that corresponds to the minimum of resources necessary for a man to live. But this standard is determined in every era by opinion. What yesterday was considered to be a sufficient minimum no longer satisfies the requirements of moral conscience today. To Durkheim's great surprise, in 1908, his remarks were greeted with shock and dismay among the economists in attendance. Opinion, Edmund Villiers replied, does not determine value which is determined by rigorous natural laws. It is always the law of supply and demand, completely independent of opinion, which determines prices as it determines all values. It is nowadays possible to say that Durkheim has failed in his project of bringing his economist colleagues to acknowledge that an economic fact is a social fact like any other, and that value is first and foremost a social institution. Had he succeeded, we perhaps could more readily engage with the normativity inherent to the production of economic knowledge. Such a move is important if we are to read through the language of assumed certainty and inevitability that currently drapes economic policy issues and that I believe in its exclusion is so damaging to our democracy. We are not, I suggest, the dependent variables of unknowable and uncontrollable forces. Indeed, as Ernst Bloch put it, the root of history is the working, creating human being who reshapes and overhauls the given facts. It would be foolish to assume that the brand of economic reason that currently dominates both academic and policy thinking is non-ideological. Here I am making reference in particular to a range of ideas and theories that relate to the neoliberal doctrine. And I do so in conscious knowledge of the difference between that doctrine and both classical and neoclassical theory. Neoliberal, neoliberalism then does make assumptions about human nature and the good society. And I am aware of the variance streams within neoliberalism, and indeed its long distance from embedded liberalism. But I think that there are values that are common to the different streams of neoliberalism, but yet these are rarely stated. Neoliberal propositions are usually presented as pragmatic responses, while ideologies are ostensibly rejected as the imputed flaw of others who may have a commitment to models of social economy or even institutional economics that might take account of contingencies such as unemployment or poverty or inequality. The widespread notion that neoliberalism as a coherent doctrine doesn't exist is highly consistent with its origins.
themselves with what Friedrich von Hayek described as the gradual encroachment of ideas that he and a number of like-minded intellectuals endeavoured to promote in the second half of the 20th century. Neoliberalism has, from those first meetings of Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich von Hayek and Milton Friedman, been a conscious ideological project. By looking at how certain structures of ideas then came to prevail, we can trace the origin of the contemporary suggested indeed, indeed claimed inevitability in policy prescriptions. I will turn in a moment to the origin of that. The systematic attempt, for example, successful, if we look from the moment of the faith, this meeting to which I have referred, to the 1990s and on to 2011-12, at all of the think tanks across the world that had been systematically established intentionally to promote a particular version of economic doctrine, basically saying, if you like, that, if, that this doctrine must not be encumbered by any state interference. In this regard, I refer to a recent publication by a historian of economic thought, Philip Mirowski. He makes an analysis of the activities of the Swiss-based Mont Pelerin Society, founded in 1947 on a closed membership basis and limited to 500 members, which was for a while the premier site of construction of neoliberalism. Mirowski describes the society as a thought collective whose project was to outline a future movement diverging from classical liberalism. And he traces in his book, Never Let a Good Crisis Go to Waste, just recently published, he traces the migration of their ideas to university departments, think tanks, and policy-making circles at both national and international level. And indeed, while I was preparing this paper, I looked at the advertisement for some posts in the United States and universities, which is explicitly stated that the applicants for the post must, in fact, be from the conservative school of economics. Explicitly. I think most recently, less people, I think I invent these things, in 2011, an advertisement that came from the University of Austin. Such an archaeological approach as I am making to economic knowledge is a tool that I believe enables us to assess the ethical consequences of the views neoliberal thinkers harbour about what it means to be human and the institutional arrangements that underpin their vision of the good society. Indeed, neoliberalism is based on very strong assumptions about human nature, as another archaeologist of ideas, Michel Foucault, put it, in neoliberalism, homo economicus is an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur of himself. This government of the self, the notion that men's economic worth can be defined in terms of human capital and skill sets, constitutes a drastic departure from classical liberal doctrine. Neoliberalism has operated little less than a profound deconstruction of the special status classical liberalism conferred on human labor. And it is worth exploring a bit further the fundamental differences between these visions of human nature. In his introduction to the republication of recent edition of Adam Smith's The Theory of Moral Sentiments, Amartya Sin notes that this book, which was Adam Smith's first Public pop, the first book, published in 1759, went, something of an, went into something of an eclipse, as he puts it, from the beginning of the 19th century. As a result of this, according to Amartya Sen, Adam Smith's second book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, widely regarded, was widely regarded as having transformed the subject of economics. It was read and interpreted largely without reference to the philosophical framework that had been developed in the earlier work, the theory of moral sentiments. If I might quote Sen, the neglect applies, among other issues, to the appreciation of the demands of rationality, the need for recognizing the plurality of human motivations, 
the connections between ethics and economics, and the codependent rather than freestanding role of institutions in general and free markets in particular. A strong tradition in economic literature grew up, therefore, and drew from what is a selective reading, even a distortion of Adam Smith's work. They focus primarily on his famous line that it is, I quote, not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. You see, this misquote fits neatly into the rational choice theory, which equates rationality, rationality with the enlightened pursuit of self-interest. Smith, of course, in the text, had spelled out very strongly the limitation of the profit motive by arguing, for example, that while prudence was, as he put it, of all the virtues that which is most helpful to the individual, humanity, justice, generosity, and public spirit are the qualities most useful to others. And these are his own words. Moreover, although he was convinced of the necessity of a well-functioning market, he never argued against the importance of economic institutions other than markets, nor did he deny that the market economy produced important omissions, as he put it. Sound political economy, Smith argued in The Wealth of Nations, has to have two distinct objects. First, to provide a plentiful revenue or subsistence for the people, or more properly, to enable them to provide such a revenue or subsistence for themselves, and secondly, to supply the state or commonwealth with a revenue sufficient for the public services that the people agree are needed. This stands in sharp contrast with the von Hayek vision of the market as a fantastic processor of information, more powerful than any human brain that necessarily surpasses the state's ability to manage and process information. And this is very important for even those now who are writing columns after the most recent crisis still stay within the frame, as it were, of a market economy that they didn't question. According to Murawski, this view of Hayek's underpins the contemporary proliferation of baroque financial instruments and the notion that the market always provides solutions to the problems it has created in the first place. So whether in the form of carbon emissions permits, microloans, or through the belief that the best people to clean up the crisis are the same bankers and financiers who caused it. Let us never forget Alan Greenspan's phrase when advocating against the regulation that was there of Wall Street in the Glass-Steagall Act. And he suggested to the president of the day, the market is screaming for product. These views also differ from neoclassical economy narratives that envisage potential markets' failure, notably in the environmental sphere through what they called externalities. Before I examine then how we might be able to introduce, embed, and sustain a strong ethical dimension in the structures, both ideological and institutional, that shape our collective life, let me suggest that Whatever the performative declarations about the rolling back of the state, which Jamie Peck labels regulation in denial, there is a distinctively constructivist dimension in neoliberalism. It is consciously created and recast. Foucault rightly emphasized the activism and perpetual interventions of proponents of that doctrine for whom the good society doesn't naturally and spontaneously arise. The state is allowed to play a role in neoliberal thinking, but it is, as you might say, retasked and restructured through the use of audit devices or the outsourcing of previously state-run services, such as mortgage lending, for example. All of the above-mentioned dimensions have to be kept in mind as we move to posit an alternative set of principles by which we might think and live more ethically. So how might we proceed to embed a strong ethical dimension in the structures that shape our collective life? 
What are the contemporary possibilities for developing ethical arts of economic government? And there is a strain in the current commentary that is quite Nietzschean in its hopelessness that we must transcend. What we might ask are the sources of ethics, and how might a consciousness on the importance of ethics be supported? Our first obvious avenue for it, action is education as a field fundamental to the formation and transformation of young people, both as subjects and agents. Indeed, the proliferation of ethical manuals and codes of conduct in the various professional sectors will, I suggest, be of only limited consequence if we do not also ensure that their purpose is understood by and not just enforced upon those for whom they are designed. I return to my point about saying, you dig out what are called the protocols. Did you follow the protocol? But why were you asked to follow the protocol? And what about the standards, for example, in relation to auditing? And I look across all the self-regulating professions and the trust that was placed in them by society, a trust that was broken. Why was it, for example, that the auditor was asked in the olden days to sign the final accounts? And was it not assumed that those who were on boards would seek to know and defend, protect the public interest? We need, if you like, to ground our ethics in our view of life itself, so that all of these other protocols and standard governing different lists and so forth and procedures are in fact applications of something that is understood and shared because it is valued. Our schools, after all, I think our school's curricula and pedagogical methods reflect the kind of humanity our society seeks and nurtures. The society we so dearly wish for will not take shape unless we acknowledge the need for an educational character and desires, the need to encourage and support critical reflection and a more holistic approach to knowledge. I have so often encountered this where somebody asking, even as we begin a new university year, are you educating for which slot? Or are you educating for life? Which slot do you think you'll fit into? Or what if there was no slot and you had spent years educating yourself, morally, and in every other way? Would you have lost the right to exist? Specifically, there would, I suggest now, be considerable merit in introducing the teaching of philosophy in our schools, which could facilitate what I have described as the fostering of an ethical consciousness in our fellow citizens. And in that regard, I was impressed to read of the submission in 2012 from the Royal Irish Academy to the Curriculum Development Committee proposing the inclusion of philosophy as a formal leaving certificate subject. In my consultation last year with a number of young people, 800, young people themselves called for something similar. And I do want to say that even an excellent version of politics and society as a subject is not an adequate substitute for the teaching of philosophy to achieve the purpose that I have described. Philosophy has a training in how to think how to address issues of decision-making in areas of life's fundamental and applied question is a gift of skill, a skill that can be taught and acquired. When widely distributed, it can facilitate the emergence of a consensus around shared concepts of rights and duty, charity, equality, in a way that acknowledges the right to democratic participation in a deliberative democracy in Habermas's sense. Moreover, if the central goal of philosophy is, as suggested by Martha Nussbaum, human flourishing, there is surely much to be gained from a return to Aristotle, among other scholars, and the field of virtue ethics, which points to an active rather than a passive view of flourishing, in which humans seek a life that they have reason to value. A second possible purpose for action is to examine the means by which we can embed in both our ideology and our institutions values that emphasize the irreducibly social and relational dimension of the human condition. In that regard, 
the directions outlined by scholars in the field of care, such as Kathleen Lynch and her colleagues from the School of Social Justice at UCD, are positive and valuable. And here I refer to care not so much as a professional sector, but primarily as an ethical sentiment, that is, as a central human capability serving a fundamental human need. I even will later this year speak about the right to care. As Kathleen Lynch puts it, bonds of friendship or kinship are frequently what bring meaning, warmth, and joy to life. They are both a vital component of what enables people to lead a successful life and an expression of our fundamental interdependence. Care, therefore, is a relational practice <clears throat> that engages both parties, emotionally, cognitively, and physically. I should say, interestingly, when I look back at the history of thought, and Francis Bacon's phrase, I, need, I lead to you nature and her children in bondage for your use. Gouge out her secrets. And all of the ideological assertions are in there. But if we were to interpret care Care for the planet, care for intergenerational justice, care for other cultures, care for other belief systems. It is in that sense I am using. Being cared for is not only a condition for survival. It is also a prerequisite for human development and well-being. All of us have urgent needs for care at various stages in our lives as a consequence of infancy, illness, impairment, or other vulnerabilities. The reification of the term vulnerable through its association with specific categories of people, vulnerable older people, vulnerable children, can obscure the fact that none of us present here tonight are invulnerable. Mind you, I have to say, the myth of the invulnerable did, of course, prevail at the center of the recklessly speculative world from which we are now trying to recover. Care, love, and friendship, understood not only as feelings, but also as modes of action, are powerful heuristic tools for the general purpose of our discussion on ethics and economics. Indeed, they quite radically undermine the vision of the human as a self-sufficient individual, concerned primarily with the enlightened pursuit of self-interest. Does it make sense, we might ask ourselves, to say that the care of mother and father give their children, rests merely on a rational calculation of their own interests. Is the instinct to care for another person quantifiable, transferable, or commodifiable? Or is it at best simply an exercise in reciprocity? To reflect on the demands of care, love, and friendship is to replace the categories of utility, efficiency, and self-love with the values of mutuality, long-term commitment, trust, and responsibility. It is to conceive of the other as an end in himself as a source of non-reciprocal responsibility in the sense of Emmanuel Levinas. Care also raises the fundamental question of how we relate to time, how we measure and institutionalize it. I should say, which I find very interesting, and I examine quotes, for example, from the United Nations, the fundamental rights of the child, which were expressed quite generally, but they're quite con in contrast to the rights that you have after childhood. It is as if you could dream of a kind of an innocent spread of rights up to a certain age, but after that, you fit it in. This question of measurement, too, is a vast and important one. I strongly believe that we need to re-examine the categories by which we measure, we gauge economic value and human worth, as well as the language we employ to do so. It is not an exaggeration to say that we live in times where economic worth is primarily seen as a matter of productive capacity. This is reflected in the use of measures for growth as the principal measure of economic health, even if that growth does not impact, for example, on the level of unemployment, the reduction of poverty, or inequality. 
there is an interesting strand of scholarship criticizing the focus on market activity as the measure of the size and health of the economy. GDP, gross domestic product, does indeed measure the flow of market transactions, but it excludes the other spheres of human activity, whatever the amount of time, effort, or care invested in them. So much of the work of maintaining and enhancing human livelihood, of course, takes place outside the market. Can we find a compass that recognizes the salience of care, love, and other activities deployed outside of the formal market sector as goods that we will recognize as of public significance. This would require no less than a redefinition of work and what is understood by good work. It is vital, then, that we find ways to formally value the unique contribution that each citizen makes to society, all the more so since we are living through an era of high unemployment. In her book, Utopia's Method, Ruth Levitas conjures up pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood member William Morris's question to expose the limitations of the current focus on GDP as an exclusive measure of growth. Is it all to end in a counting house on the top of a cinder heap? Morris asked in 1894, to which question one might give the reply, by quoting Keynes, once we allow ourselves to be disobedient to the test of an accountant's profit, we have begun to change our civilization. In other words, the cinder heap can only be avoided if we change what the counting house counts and start measuring everything that matters, including education, health, and the care we take of our natural environment. Since the 1970s, a significant concession in this regard has been made to the arguments against GDP as an exclusive measure, notably through the development of social indicators. The United Nations Human Development Indicators now includes aggregate measures of human capital, health status, educational participation, and then to a number of prominent economists, while staying within the frame of market economics, have argued in favor of a focus on the well-being and happiness of populations rather than on GDP, as have, for example, Joseph Stiglitz, Amartya Sen, Jean-Paul Fitoussi in their 2009 report on economic performance and social progress. But perhaps the problem is even more profound than any choice of indicators and has to do with the very notion that it is possible to count and quantify such things as happiness or human progress. The fascination with quantification is a distinctive feature of our times. The rise of mathematical economics and its current hold on policy has a very noble history. That trend can be traced to Leon Walras's Elements of Pure Economics and the Marginalist Revolution, back to William Petty, the first numerical economist whose ideas were later developed by Kerryman, Cantillon, and Jevons. In the late 17th century, Petty described his endeavor in the following terms. The method I take to do this is not yet very usual. For instead of using comparative and superlative words and intellectual arguments, I have taken the course as a specimen of the political arithmetic I have long aimed at to express myself in terms of number, weight, or measure. As to the project of renewal, then, I would like to make the contentious assertion that economics as a discipline may gain in considering itself as a craft rather than as a science. I think it is more faithful to the best of its intellectual history if it defines itself as craft and abandons its pretensions to science. I share Luth Levitas' argument in Utopia's Method that we cannot measure happiness, love, or grace, or put a price on the beauty of the earth. Alternative conceptualizations of human worth and social progress are plainly possible. Finally, about our institutions. We need to make sure in our journey to the ethical discourse that we need that all our institutions allow for truly democratic deliberations on economic policy choices, 
that no particular sector gets preferential treatment in the name of a narrow conception of wealth, and that our media, too, do not foreclose the political debate on economic matters. We should, as a nation, be able, I suggest, to conduct this reflection on economic issues in a way that respects the thread of discourse, even if we are to disagree. And for this, we might draw on the recent work on Europe of Jürgen Habermas, which suggests that democratic participation and self-development can go together when they are informed by the values of tolerance, reciprocity, morality, and reflexivity. As importantly, if we genuinely want to develop a society in which people are confident of having ample prospects for caring and solitary relationships, then we must endeavour to change the structures that impede the development of such relationships, restore the commitment to reducing poverty and economic inequality as a project that must be at the very heart of public action. In doing so, our commitment to equality must go beyond the notion of equality of opportunity and face our own often buried, hidden selfishness. In his 1931 book, entitled Equality. The historian Orich Tony depicted, through his parable of the frog and the tadpoles, the convenient self-delusions on the part of those members of society from whom one might have expected their being vocal in opposition to inequalities. Why were they silent? Intelligent tadpoles, Tony wrote, reconcile themselves to the inconvenience of their position by reflecting that although most of them will live to be tadpoles and nothing more, the most fortunate of the species will one day shed their tails, distend their mouths and stomachs, hop nimbly on the dry land and croak addresses to their former friends on the virtue by which tadpoles of character and capacity can raise to be frogs. It is possible, I suggest, to build our society on the principle of solidarity, which in the short term means, as I wrote in Renewing the Republic, establishing a floor of citizenship below which no citizen would be allowed to fail. In a republic, the right to shelter, food security, education, a good environment, and free, freedom from fear and insecurity from childhood to old age must be the benchmarks. In that book, Remember that it's the way I use freedom, so different from the freedom that von Hayek speaks about, which is a freedom against the state in his sense. Marfuckel Square, to conclude, may I say, by stressing the, by stress the formulation of explicit alternative scenarios for the future is fundamental to any kind of democratic debate. Discovering and developing in our present thinking about the economy and society an orientation to alternative possible futures entails very much more than a return to business as usual. As I have written elsewhere, we need a discourse which will envisage the alternative inclusive society and the new social economics. This is what Ernst Bloch called anticipatory illumination. It is not only about the right to survive, it is about the right to flourish. We must do all this as Leonard Cohn might put it, utilizing the light let in by the cracks, doing what we can do now, taking opportunities while holding fast to our vision for the medium and longer term and a different society. And if from all of the possible starting points I had a choice, I think I would reflect on Aristotle's av advice to his son, Nicomachus, that friendship makes a demand on our virtue greater than justice. An ethics of Aristotelian friendship, infused with notions of care and responsibility, is a fruitful paradigm to conceive of our relations to our fellow citizens and to future generations. It also provides a fitting mode of envisaging and acting for the future of our fragile planet, more so perhaps than notions of short-term utility or even preservation. Finally, we must reclaim the future 
as an arena of hope, as Bruno Schulz put it, the possibility suggests itself that no dreams, however absurd or senseless, are wasted in the universe. Embedded in the dream is a hunger for its own reification, a demand that imposes an obligation on reality. The point, therefore, is not to rescue any lesser pragmatism, but to raise up our humanity, and in doing so eliminate so much fear from our lives, enjoy the endless possibilities of our lives together, taking care. Good morning.